We're taking a closer look at the establishment of the Kavango Zambezi Transfrontier Conservation Area. We're now joined here in studio by Ernest Mohaneri, who is the director of the Transfrontier Conservation Unit at the South African Department of Environmental Affairs. Later on, we're hoping to be joined from Botswana for a perspective there by Dr. Victor Siamudala, who's a program manager at the CASA Secretariat. Ernest, thanks so much uh, for joining us. The Transfrontier Conservation Area, it's existed for quite a while now, but now the five countries have entered into a treaty. What does that mean? Well, let me start by greeting the viewers at home um, and to just say that um, the first Transfrontier Conservation Areas to be established in the region was uh, between South Africa and Botswana, and that was Kalahadi Transfrontier Park. Right. And other Transfrontier Conservation Areas were later established. And as we were as establishing the Transfrontier Parks, we realized that, in fact, it would be cheaper uh, for the region to consolidate the development of Transfrontier Conservation Areas under one um, marketing brand. Right. Um, so the Kavango Transfrontier Conservation Areas is the recent development on those that are already established. Mm. But I think it's important to indicate um, the significance of the signing of the treaty by the five heads of state mm -hmm. in Angola recently. Right. Um, the treaty provides for a legal mechanism for the officials of the countries to establish structures that are responsible for mm -hmm. managing and developing the transfrontier conservation areas. When we talk about those structures, what do we mean exactly? Because some would say, you know, you've got a fairly wealthy country like South Africa um, versus a country that's had its own liquidity challenges like Zimbabwe, the kinds of resources that each member state is meant to commit to making the Transfrontier Park a success? Well, um, it is important just to mention that whilst South Africa might be having the resources, uh, when it comes to Transfrontier Conservation Areas, there are instances where the portion of a park is bigger in a neighboring country. I'll give an example. Kalahadi Transfrontier Park the bigger portion belongs to Botswana mm. and the smaller portion to South Africa. And of course, the bigger money is made by South Africans mm. because they have investment on their component. Yeah. So in that instance, um, the contribution to the park is not necessarily going to be equal and the benefits accruing from the park is also not necessarily going to be equal. Yeah. Let's get a view from Dr. Victor Siamudala here. Thanks so much for joining us on the line from Botswana. We really need to ensure that this Transfrontier Park works well, that it's successful. What sort of lessons can we learn from Botswana? Because as has been said by Ernest earlier on, initially this was a relationship between South Africa and Botswana. So you've had legway in terms of developing models of conservation success. Well, I think there are a lot of lessons that um, CASA can learn from the other TFCs that um, uh, were established much earlier than the CASA Transfrontier Conservation Area. Uh, one of the major lessons is that of um, mutual trust between the countries that are involved in the uh, Transfrontier Conservation Area itself. The political will and commitment mm. uh, that the governments that are involved in establishing the TFCA have uh, in order to ensure that this works out uh, to the benefit of the government and the people mm. that live in the landscape. Uh, there is also the issue of commitment of resources, uh, including that of manpower itself yeah. to the TFCA in order to make it work. And then there is also need to develop workable strategies and solutions that should address the issues that are current within the landscape. So there are quite a good number of lessons that um, the CASA TFC is able to learn from the other um, TFC that um, were developed much earlier, and even from Botswana, which is uh, one of the partner countries within the CASA TFC. Now, Victor, give us your perspective on the so-called battle between man and beast. We're dealing here with economies that are really powering ahead, wanting to see growth surpassing 6 7% so that we can industrialize and become truly fully-fledged emerging markets. That means population growth. That probably means um, a need for industrial resources and assets that could encroach on the livelihood of nature and the animals around us. It is a real tension. How do we manage that tension? 
Well, I think in terms of the Casa TFC, the partner government have been very clear and emphatic in terms of uh, regional sustainable development. That is true. Um, there is conservation that has to take place within these TFCs. But he, like in the case of Casa, uh, this is a landscape that comprises various land uses. There is communal land where people practice agriculture. There is private land where people use various kind of um, activities and investments. Uh, there is also protected areas. But the issue that the government has been very clear about is that whatever developments that have to take place, even outside the natural resources sector, mm. this must be done within the context of environmental sustainability. I think there's one thing that we have to be very clear as uh, developing countries in southern Africa right. is that um, we do not need to damage the environment in, in, the, in our continued quest to industrialize because there is a direct relationship between um, in industrialization and economic growth mm. with the environment itself. If mm. we damage the environment to a level that um, it cannot be reversed, right. even the industries themselves will find it very difficult to sustain their growth. I'd just like to get Ernest. Well, I'd like to get Ernest's comment on this one. You know, in the whole commodity play, we're increasingly moving into outside of urban areas, into these rural communities, into these national heritage sites. There was the case of Mapungubwe recently, and prospecting for coal. So it's a real tension. I think it's important to uh, remind the viewers at home that uh, the future of the world is dependent on us striking a balance between industrialization and natural resources that we depend on for our living. An example would be the water production in Lesotho, in the mountain of Lesotho, for an example, that serves Gauteng economic uh, center, that we are dependent in the conservation of the landscape that produces that water which we need today and which will be needed even tomorrow and by the future generations. Mm. It's important also just to mention that uh, as we speak, there was a meeting this morning between the Department of Environmental Affairs mm. and Coal of Africa. Mm. And the purpose of that meeting was to find a solution to striking a balance between the need to do mining and to preserve yeah. the natural resources for current use and for use by the future generations as well. Ernest, let's move this thing forward. There's obviously s synergy between a transfrontier park, for instance, and growing ecotourism. And tourism, we're told, could be a huge gainer for GDP and job creation. What are we doing in that area? Well, I think it's important just to mention, uh, maybe let me cite the Kalakadi Transfrontier Park that since the park was declared a transfrontier park, the numbers of the travelers to the park has increased. I want to cite the reason why that is the case. We established a tourist access facility which allows people in Namibia to visit Kalahadi. It also allows the German travelers who come by big numbers to Namibia to access the park. And that's a clear indication of the value that we can derive from the natural resources whilst we are preserving them. Final comment from you, uh, Victor. There's also a question of securing borders because once it's a transfrontier park, the borders are fairly fluid. Two issues, big problems that we have in Southern Africa with rhino and elephant poaching. So there's a big need to police some of these borders for the protection of these animals. But secondly, it's the economic issue you're talking about. If we have better policing and better monitoring, then we can also manage issues like climate change and see which areas are more susceptible. Well, I think one of the issues that um, the TFCA brings as an advantage in terms of um, uh, security for the wildlife uh, species in these TFCAs is the actual collaboration and networking that the governments um, are establishing in terms of extending information on law enforcement operations uh, that are, will be conducted along these uh, international boundaries. Uh, the people that are involved in all these, the wildlife personnel will always share their information they will have combined uh, operations. There will be designated crossing points uh, that uh, tourists and uh, other people that are doing with normal business are supposed to, the normal border posts and additional areas that will be created. Uh, so it will be quite easy to at least mobilize the resources and be able to deal with issues mm -hmm. of illegal uh, wildlife in terms of poaching. Um, 
But the, I, I didn't get you clearly on the second question. Okay, it was just a question on climate change, but I thank you so much for your inputs there, Dr. Victor Siamudala. Maybe you'd like to handle that for us. It's obviously different ecosystems around these five countries. So you have wetlands, you have savanna, you have drylands, and then the temperatures are rising with climate change. How do we get all countries to work together on the climate change agenda? Let me just make a remark on the, uh, the value of having Transfrontier Parks for security. I think it's important to mention that the current poachers are transnational people, which makes it important for countries to collaborate. Mm. Because they, if there was no collaboration, for an example, they would then you take advantage of poaching one country and crossing the border to another country. So the collaboration makes it easier for us to uh, take care of the cross-border crime. Secondly, to use the, the greater numbers by the countries involved. Well, in, on, on the question of the climate change, I think it's important to state that um, there are areas already or examples in I, I, Rectorsville Transfrontier Park where the animals, when it's dry on one area, they move to the area where it's uh, not so dry. Mm. And of course, if we then remove the fences, that makes it easier for animals, if it's dry on one area, right. to move to another area. I think it's also important just to speak a bit more about the plant seed. You would, uh, of course, know that uh, the plant seed go, uh, are taken by wind. So it, the, the transplanter allows the plant seed to uh, be protected if they move from one area to another mm -hmm. area, if that environment is protected. Okay. So those would be the benefits that we are likely to derive from having a right. transfrontier conservation areas as a mitigation to climate right. change. I think we need a much bigger forum for all these issues because they're so complex. But thanks for simplifying it for us. Uh, Ernest Mohaneri, who's the director of the Transfrontier Conservation Unit in the Department of Environmental Affairs here in South Africa. We also had Dr. Victor Siamudala, who was from the CASA Secretariat in Botswana.